The scripture reading this morning is from Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Listen for the word of God. Right then, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the crowds. When he sent them away, he went up onto a mountain by himself to pray. Evening came, and he was alone. Meanwhile, the boat, fighting a strong headwind, was being battered by the waves and was already far away from land. <coughs> Very early in the morning, he came to his disciples walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! They were so frightened, they screamed. Just then, Jesus spoke to them. Be encouraged. It's me. Don't be afraid. Peter replied, Lord, if it's you, order me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Then Peter got out of the boat and was walking on the water toward Jesus. But when Peter saw the strong wind, he became frightened. As he began to sink, he shouted, Lord, rescue me! Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him, saying, You man of weak faith, why did you begin to have doubts? When they got into the boat, the wind settled down. Then those in the boat worshipped Jesus and said, You must be God's son. These are God's words for God's people. You're not spontaneous. My wife said to me last Sunday morning, and as I'm asking her a series of questions, okay, uh, dear, is this shirt going to work with these jeans? This is too casual. And, you know, they're back to the closet trying to pick out something that doesn't need ironing because there's no time to do that. And so, you, I, I don't know if you know, but so I lay a couple of things out on the bed, a couple of shirts, and say, dear, can you, and she looks at me, and she goes, you know, what happened to you picking out the stuff on Saturday night? You are not spontaneous. I said, I am too, when we're on vacation. But weirdly, but, and my wife is right, as always. That's on camera. My wife is right as always. Spontaneity is not one of my big strengths. And in the strength finder, the strengths come out planning, strategic, futuristic, competitive. I know you're surprised. Hey, but those, those are my strengths. And so I find it kind of ironic that I'm always drawn to Peter, the disciple. And he is one of my favorite disciples. And I wish, I want to be more like Peter, but he always seems he's really spontaneous. You know, and early on, he's there and just had a bed night of fishing, and, and, and Jesus, and he catches some stuff, and really without thinking about the consequences to his business partners, his, uh, his family, his future, he just leaves everything to follow Jesus. And then, you know, he's the one that, when Jesus starts talking about suffering and, and having to be crucified, Peter just, you know, kind of pulls him aside and says, Jesus, we're not going to have that kind of talk. You know, things are going too good. Let's not talk about bad stuff. And he says, and don't worry, we're going to be with you all the way, even if we had to die. And yet, when the time came, he just kind of ran off. I wonder if he really thought about the consequences. In the garden, Peter's the one who... Uh, According to some of the Gospels, whips out the sword to defend Jesus. And now we have Peter out on a boat, on a lake with others, with a storm. And Jesus comes to them in the midst of the storm. And Peter says, hey, if Jesus, if that's for you, tell me to get out of the boat and come to you on the water. Now, I'm wondering, is Peter really spontaneous or is he just impetuous? Now, spontaneity in, involves some thought about the consequences. Impetuousness, they don't care about the consequences. And sometimes it is hard to tell the difference. And, and so that wonderful, coveted road trip, you know, is that spontaneous or is that just impetuous? But there's Peter on the boat. Is it impetuous, or is this a spontaneous 
act of courageous faith. To, to put the story in a little bit of context, they've been following Jesus for a substantial amount of time. They've been following Jesus for a substantial amount of time. They've heard his teachings. They've heard the Sermon on the Mount. They, they've heard Jesus teach it in many parables, and sometimes these teachings have just kind of left, left them scratching their heads. I, I, I don't know about you, but some of the teachings of Jesus leave me scratching my head. You know, like the one about the mustard seed. It says, if you just have that little bit of faith, that little bit, you know, and the, and the mustard seed, he says, you know, it's the smallest, but if you grow up to the largest plant, that mustard, from that little tiny mustard seed, you can grow to six, maybe even 30 feet. It says, if you just have that amount of, of faith, you know, you can, you can do great things. mountains. You can move mountains. It was just that little bit of faith. And yet, sometimes things don't seem to change, do they? They just seem to stay the same. And we resign ourselves and we just say, you know, it is what it is. But just that little bit of faith. They, they've heard Jesus say that. They've seen Jesus uh, heal even Peter's mother-in-law. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. He has he's fed people. And, and right before this, he has fed over 5,000 with just a couple of fish and a couple of loaves of bread, uh, bread rolls, a, a boy's lunch. And, and there's enough leftovers that each disciple, all 12, have to go out and gather the crumbs. And there's a basket full of leftovers for each of those skeptical disciples. You know, and now... After Jesus said it abruptly, because it started out right then, after this right then, he sends them away. He sends them out onto the lake. He then dismisses the crowd, and Jesus is going to go spend some time by himself. He goes up to the mountain. And I just imagine Jesus hearing, as, as there's all this going on with the, the miracle and all the teaching and the large crowd, you know, in, the, in that voice, he hears it, that invitation be still and know that I am God. From Psalm 46. Just be still and know that I am God. And if Jesus wants to experience some stillness, you know, and he goes up to the mountain, and in the stillness of the night, and being still with God, he's communing with God. And on the lake is a different story. On the lake is a different story. And they went out there in the evening, and it's into the late night, into the early morning. They, they've been buffeted by the waves through the storm, and the you know, the tossing the, the ship around, and, and they're afraid. And, and then off in the distance, they see the silhouette. The silhouette coming towards them. They go, it's a ghost! Well, that's terrifying, but not really unexpected. Because in that day and time, they believed that the sea was really the place of the death and chaos. In fact, when there was a ritual for those sailors that were going to be in the deep sea, it was a ritual that was almost akin to a funeral because they did not expect them to return. And when they were returned, it was a great celebration like Easter, like they came back from the dead. But for them, the sea was a place that was absent from God, completely void of God. And so to see a ghost on this place of dead it is not totally unexpected, yet scary. And how many, how, have, have any of you ever done one of those ghost tours? You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you see a ghost, it's, I mean, that's what you want to do, right? I mean, it's going to be scary, but not really unexpected. I mean, you're kind of hoping for that. I mean, this is the time of year uh, haunted houses are going to open. Uh, you expect to be scared, and yet it's still scary, and, and that's what they have. And, and yet Jesus is there. Jesus is there coming to them on the water. There is Jesus hovering over the chaos and the storm. Jesus, God in the flesh, coming to them in the, in the chaos, but still somehow staying above it. And, and I hear an echo of the way it all begins. The, the history of the world and humanity from the very first words in, in Genesis where it says, where nothing existed but chaos. The earth was formless and void. God's spirit moved over the surface.
surface of the waters. And here we have God in the flesh moving over the surface of the waters in the midst of this chaos. And the very first words are, be encouraged. See, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the storm, those words come to us. Be encouraged. It is I, Jesus, coming to them. And, and, and Peter, hearing those words, he, he, he gives that wonderful demand of Jesus. Jesus, if that's you, call the storm like you've done before. Peter say, call the storm like he had before? No. Why didn't he? He should have. That's what I would have said. Is that what you would have said? And he had called the storm before, early after. They, all the disciples started following. The first miracle that Jesus does exclusively for the disciples was calling the storm. They're out on a boat. The storm comes up. Jesus is asleep in the back. They wake him up and they panic. And say, Jesus, calm the storm. He says, be calm. And there's this dead calm. And now Jesus is coming to the him. And, you know, why doesn't Peter say, Jesus, you know, even the wind and the sea obey, you call the storm. Because that, that's what we want, isn't it? In the midst of the storms, in the midst of the chaos, isn't that what we call Jesus to do? Jesus, calm the storm for us. Just calm us. I, well, I don't know. Let me check. Uh, let's see if you prefer chaos or calmness. How many of you prefer chaos? Raise your left foot. <laughs> How about calmness? Anybody prefer calmness? Yeah. And it, it, it's natural, right? I mean, that's, that's where we love that invitation from the psalm. Be still and know that I am God. And we love that. But here's the thing. That can't be a permanent state. Sometimes we're called out of the boat into the chaos. You know, Jesus is there coming, but Jesus doesn't seem to be as anxious about the storm and the chaos as we are. Jesus could have, I'm interested, Jesus could have called the storm when he was still on the mountain. And then Jesus would have had more time just to be still and communion with God. When he, when he got to the shore of the lake and he sees the storm, Jesus could have yelled out, be called. But he didn't. When he's coming to them on the water and they yell, it's a ghost, and he hears them, Jesus could have called the storm them and called them down, but he didn't. He, and see, there is something more vital in this story about our discipleship than just Jesus calming the storm. There is something more vital in our discipleship to following Jesus than just Jesus coming and calming all our storms and chaos. Peter says, Jesus, call me to come to you. I wish I was more like Peter. Jesus says, get out of the boat. Do you get out of the boat? I mean, is this impetuous? No, I think it's probably a courageous act of faith on the part of Peter. I think Peter is saying, Jesus, I want to do what you do. Oh, I wish I was more like Peter. Jesus, I want to do what you do. Call me into the chaos, but help me to stay above it. Not be overwhelmed by it. See, I wish I wouldn't pray so much as for Jesus to calm the storm as I would to say, Jesus, help me not be overwhelmed by it. Not be overcome by it. And I wish I wouldn't pray so much. Jesus, just calm the storm. As Jesus, help me make it through the chaos as I come to you. I wish I was more like Peter. And there's Peter. He gets out of the boat onto the chaos. Now, I don't know if he just jumps over. If he, you know, they're holding him and he's slowly getting in there to see. But Peter gets <coughs> out of the boat into the chaos. And he walks on the he walks on the chaos. He stays above the chaos. Now I think this is the first miracle of one of the disciples. 
The first miracle of one of the disciples is to be able to get in the midst of chaos but not be overcome by it because of faith. I wish I was more like Peter. Well, up to this point. Then he starts to focus on the chaos. He becomes overwhelmed by it. He becomes overcome by it. And he starts to sink. And, and Jesus says, wow. I mean, you know, here's Peter's faith. It's short-lived. You know, Jesus says, you have little faith. Uh, so it's time for our Greek word of the sermon series. Uh, it's the word that's translated uh, little or small. Uh, aglado. Uh, but it also means short, as in short-lived. And, and here I think it's a better translation. Oh, Peter, your faith is so short-lived. Because if Jesus was talking about faith, oh, you of just having a little faith, it do that doesn't make sense what, what Jesus said about the mustard seed in a parable before and will say in just a little while to him when he says, if you just have that teeniest amount of faith of the mustard seed, you're going to move them out. I'm not sure why Jesus would rebuke people of having a small amount of faith when that's the small, when that's the same amount that Jesus is calling them to have. It says if you just have that much. So it's short-lived. And it's short-lived because as Peter is going through the chaos and storm, he's overcome by it, he focuses on it, and his faith wanes. Anybody with Peter? He's overcome and he begins to sink. And it's hard to get up. The USS Alexander Hamilton is a, uh, was a nuclear-powered submarine. Uh, I was aboard for a little while, got to go on a training uh, exercise with them. I know some of you heard this story before, but I was practicing my sermon out loud yesterday. My daughter Rocco suggested I tell the story again. And, and so I, I'm on board the submarine. We get underway, and it's time to die. We're going to go in excess of 600 feet below. And, and so the skipper, the commanding officer, invites me into the con, the control room. And, and all of a sudden, the orders are given to dive. They're repeated. And there's this intense attention given. But I mean, there's this movement, maneuvers, and people are doing it. It's busy. It seems chaotic. Uh, but they're all, you know, you're just trying to stand while you're diving down deep and holding on to something so you don't fall over. And, and finally, after a while, it levels out. And it's still and calm. And, and the skipper of the boat he said, well, Chaplain, what do you think about that? I said, well, sir, and obviously this is a very complicated and difficult maneuver to get a submarine 600, in excess of 600 feet below. He goes, eh, Chaplain, that really if you think about it. If you throw a big rock into the ocean, it sinks. He says the real hard thing is going to be getting back up. <laughs> Isn't that true? When we start being overcome by the chaos, the real hard thing is to get back up, especially if we do it ourselves or try to do it ourselves. And I think the real difficult thing, and perhaps one of the most courageous acts of faith in the story, is Peter asking Jesus to help him. Peter doesn't try to do it himself. Peter knows he can't do it himself. He's in the midst of the chaos. He let himself over, be overcome by the chaos, but he's not going to get himself back up. He yells to Jesus, Jesus, help me. Help me. Oh, I wish I was more like Peter. There you are on a boat. Storm comes up. You see Jesus coming to you. You yell at this, really you tell me to come. Jesus says, come. And as uh, Stephen Cuss mentions in his book, Banishing Leadership Anxiety, you know, you adventurous types, you're just going to jump out of the boat. Uh, you know, you're adventure junkies, you're happy to jump out of any boat into the unknown. But others of you are more cautious. Either way, all of us need to measure our comfort zone. And then move two or three steps, which is probably all that Peter took. Take those two or three steps into those uncharted waters. 
uncharted for us, but not for God, who has been there all along waiting for us to take that courageous step of faith. 